Hi, um, this is topic six, and what we're looking at is classic design. And so the first topic in topic six is characteristics of a classic design. So first of all, a design classic is a product that serves as a standard of its time and has been manufactured industrially and has a timeless appeal. And, you know, of course, you yeah, a little um, Swiss Army knife, classic, classic, classic design. Uh, basically not changed for, for decades. And so, you know, this is the kind of thing that is, is iconic. When you look at this, you know exactly what it is. There's no doubt about in your mind what you're looking at. And, and these, are, these are classic, classic, classic designs, um, virtually unchanged since they were first uh, manufactured um, back in the day. And, and they're manufactured industrially, so they have, um, you know, relatively inexpensive compared to, um, say, a custom-made piece. Okay, so... When we're talking about a classic design, um, we're talking about something that is iconic. So the word iconic means that it's very famous, popular, that um, you know, it especially represents a particular opinion. Um, you know, if you're talking about like a, an iconic person or a particular time. And so when we're talking about iconic, we're talking about something that has longevity. So it's been around a long, long time. You know, for instance, this this uh, electric guitar right here um, is called a Telecaster. And this has been around since 19, the 1950s. And so it is virtually unchanged since the 1950s. So it has a, a, a large degree of longevity. Uh, there, there's also demand for it, right? So it continues to be demand. Um, and it's not heavily dependent on marketing and advertisement. Um, although, you know, you'll see things like Coke bottles and Coke, you know, definitely they're, they're into marketing their product, but they also have a classic design. Um, so, you know, yeah, we do want to remind new generations of the intrin intrinsic value of the classic design. So there is some marketing that takes place, but, but generally not a ton of it. Um, the design is often widely imitated uh, with cheaper versions, and uh, this also reinforces the status of the original design as a pioneering concept. Okay, so, you know, again, like, you, you'll you see knockoff guitars like this um, in places, uh, but they're basically copying the original. So uh, this is an example of, of, a, of a, just a perfect, iconic, classic design. Here's some other ones that you'll recognize, and, and um, you know, just basically instantaneously. This is a, a 1963 Porsche 911, and this is a 2020 Porsche 11, 911, and they're virtually... The same, you know, well, not virtually the same. This one's, um, I'm sure, you know, better in a lot of ways. But the the, the concept in there, they're just recognizable in their shape, in their design, where their engine is. They both have engines in the back. Um, you know, they're, they're just a classic, classic design, instantly recognizable. These are a pair of uh, Levi's jeans from 150 years ago, and they're instantly recognizable um, compared to a pair from today. So just, you know, understanding that, wow, those things, they, they haven't changed much in over 150 years. They're being, they have longevity, they're classic, you, you see them, you recognize them. This is a Vespa, this is a, uh, an older model Vespa, one of the first models, and this is a current model. This is a 1941 um, Volkswagen Beetle, and they stopped making these um, in this same shape, um, exactly the same shape in, in 2003. Um, but they do have a newer model, which I didn't put on here. But this is a 2003. This is a 1941. And again, when you see this, they're, they're pretty recognizable. Um, here's another quick example of that. Uh, this is called a uh, Tonette uh, Brothers chair. And basically it had, you know, this is a cafe chair that that's, that uh, these guys invented. It was sort of like the first flat pack um, design. And it's it's a classic. You know, and this is from 150 years ago. This is from, I think, uh, or more than 150 years ago. Well, yeah, more than 150 years ago. And so, you know, they're virtually unchanged today. And it's, it's a very classic design. Okay. Now, some classic designs may not be functional. They may be technologically obsolete. Um, they may sell in very small numbers. Um, but there's still a viable um, commercial operation and production for them. And some of the resale in these things um, increases enormously over time, and the number of products available lessens, right? So um, uh, such products uh, can become very collectible and, and investment value, for example, classic cars, but also toys. So 
Um, another product uh, may not be intrinsically worth as much money, but are value to certain owners and collectors, such as toys. And so these are some examples here. These are some some of the first Star Wars um, action figures, and these are again an iconic classic design. Uh, before the Star Wars figures like this, they um, if you wanted like an action figure, generally the action figures were were uh, quite a bit bigger. So these I think. Um, you know they're they're roughly 10 centimeters tall. Before that, you would get it. You'd be getting double, triple the, the size of these things. And and these actually set off a whole um, line of toys. You can think of GI Joe. You can think of He Man, or you know a whole bunch of things. And you know all the way up till today, um, were based on these things. And and these are just classic designs. And now they're not not producing these particular Star Wars uh, figures anymore. Um, if you were to buy current Star Wars figures, they would be roughly the same size. Um, but you know they probably have better functionality. These guys had only joints at the hip and the arms, um, at the shoulders. I think some of them their heads might even turn, but most of them, they're you know basically uh, five parts to them, and that's it. Um, but these are highly collectible, and and you know you could have bought them back in the day for for not much money, and today these are some of these toys are, are worth thousands and thousands of dollars because uh, people are are collecting them. And that that you know they're not producing them, so you know you know things get destroyed uh, over time. Um, you know, you, somebody has a fire in their house and they have a collection of Star Wars toys. Well, there goes that collection. So that the number of these things decreases over time, and that increases their value. Okay. Um, now, one of the things to understand about this idea of classic design is that for, for many years, it really referred to sort of a, a classical architecture and furniture. So, you know, something that you would think would, be, would fit into like a Roman emperor's home and, you know, something like this. So this lounge. Um, but these were not made for the, the masses, right? Like these were individually crafted things. They were really expensive and most people couldn't afford to, to actually buy these. Now, with the advent of mass production, right, so as you started to get um, industrialization and mass production, it meant that you could, you, could, um, you could have cheaper alternatives, right? So at first, those cheaper alternatives were not good quality. But as mass production techniques got better, some of the ways that the manufacturing techniques and the materials that people used um, started to make things that were, were really, really well designed and cost effective for production. And that, this made it so that, that um, you know, a classic design was no longer something that only rich people could, could afford. I mean, this thing right here is going to be really expensive. It's made out of expensive wood. I'm sure it's made out of expensive um, fabrics. So it's it's a really expensive thing. Now these are these are also pretty expensive. Like you wouldn't just you know, but but much much cheaper. So this is an Ames chair, and this is a, a very very classic design. But it's made basically out of aluminum, so the the legs are aluminum, and then this is a, a bended um, a bent uh, plywood. So these this design right here is classic. It is a is a true design classic, and it was made for mass production and for people to be able to afford it. Whereas this is is meant for elites, and before industrial the industrial revolution and the advent the advent of mass production, really expensive furniture was made for elites. Anything that, that you had in your house that was, if you were you know a poor person, because essentially back before the industrial revolution there were two classes: there was uh, rich people, and then there were poor people, and most people were poor. You would have very very rough furniture in your house, and very little of it at that. Okay. So image, image is important. So when we're talking about um, classic design, you have to understand that, that the image has to be instantaneously recognizable, right? Um, so Coke is a classic example of this, right? Like this Coke bottle, the shape of this Coke bottle is virtually unchanged for you know the last hundred and so years, uh, more than a hundred years easily. And um, you know, these are some just glass bottles of, of Coke from different countries. Um, but you know, even their plastic bottles have that exact same shape. So it is an instantly recognizable product, instantly, right? We we just know what it is right off the bat. Um, the Volkswagen Beetle, um, which I showed you in a, in a past slide, also is is instantly recognizable for for many people around the world. Okay, status. So uh, classic designs also confer status. So when we're talking about statics, status and, and classic design, um, we're 
you know, products considered as classic designs often increase in value and can project a certain status as they become more desirable. Uh, the ownership of a classic design can increase the perceived status of an individual. So, you know, it's, it's going to increase your perceived status. Uh, it's, you know, something that has a connection with, with wealth, right, with the elite class. And it conveys a, a feeling of satisfaction. Um, and then it also, you know, there's a feeling when you own something that is kind of rare, like a classic design. So that's something that uh, appeals to people. So it's going to help increase your status within the society. Culture. So we have to talk about a cultural context when we're talking about classic design because culture plays a really important part. So they reflect cultural influences and mark transition points within a particular culture. Uh, the culture of concern may be national, religious, subculture, uh, such as the particular youth culture or movement. And, you know, I'm just using a a, a beautiful classic design here as an example. These are Air Jordans. This is the first, you know, first uh, design for Air Jordans, and they're really not that different than a current design. So this is a, you know, what you would get in 2020, and these are classic, right? Like, and and the people who wear them, there's a certain subculture, and that culture. I mean, Michael Jordan stopped playing basketball in I don't know in the 90s or the early 2000s. Um, yet he is still recognizably an icon in basketball. So somebody who is into basketball, into that culture, uh, you know, is going to be, this is going to appeal to them, this classic design. Um, and, and, you know, people collect these things. So people will collect old pairs of Air Jordans, and, and uh, some of them can be worth a lot of money. I, I believe this particular pair auctioned off for something in the thousands of dollars. Okay, obsolescence. So there's a stage, you know, we know about this from, from earlier lectures, that there's a stage in a product life cycle where a product is no longer needed, even though it functions as well as it did when it was manufactured. Classic design tends to trans transcend obsolescence, which means that, you know, the it doesn't go away. Um, and they can be desired long after they're, they're ceased to manufact be manufactured. So, you know, here's a couple of examples of those. These things right here, these are our uh, insulators. They're glass insulators that used to go on the end of um, electrical um, overhead electrical wire uh, poles. And so they would just basically, you would wrap the electrical wire around this and, and it, would, it would insulate the, the electrical wire from, from grounding. Um, and people collect these things, right? You know, they're no longer used because they're, they're, they're basically obsolete. We have better things, you know, ceramics that are better than glass. But uh, people still collect these things, and they are, are a classic design. These are also some uh, classic designs. These are, you know, little Fisher-Price toys that, uh, that um, people, you know, they're very basic, right? Like they have no arms, no legs. They've just got, you know, you know <laughs> not much to them, right? They've got a head and, and, a, and a body that's basically a peg. Um, yet people recognize these as classic. Now, kids today may not want them. They're functional. We can use them. These would be functional also. Uh, however, these are, uh, you know, these are things that people would still desire and collect. Okay, omnipresence. So omnipresence is the context of a, in the context of a classic design. It's a product that is um, that has existed and been in circulation for a long time. And I'm going to use the telephone as an example. And also when we get to ubiquitous. So ubiquitous in the context of classic design is a product that is. Um, uh, one can be found almost every, anywhere. And so, again, mobile phones here, right? You know, so telephones have been around for over 100 years, well over 100 years. Um, and, you know, in when they started to look like this, we start to get into this idea of a classic design, right? In fact, we still use this telephone lo logo for cell phones like this, you know? And, and why would we? They, it, it's, it's a classic design, though, right? So that's why it's there in your, on your cell phone. Um, you know, and then you can consider the iPhone as a classic design because it is iconic, right? Like it is something that is ubiquitous. It's iconic. People have copied it. You know, the, the Samsung, um, galaxies and, um, uh, Huawei and, and, and you name any of the, the cell phones, they, they basically look alike, right? But the iPhone one was the, the classic design that, that started, kicked the whole thing off. And then all other uh, cell phones um, 
smartphones basically look roughly similar to what the iPhone 1, 1 did, including the iPhone 11, right? So this is, a, it's omnipresent because it's been, it's, the telephone is something that's been manufactured for over, you know, well over 100 years, um, and then it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, right? You can find these things everywhere. Basically, almost everyone you know probably has a cell phone. All right, a dominant design. So a dominant design is a design that contains uh, implicit features of a product that are recognized as essential by the majority of manufacturers and, and, and producers. So, you know, a great example of this is a, a Bic pen. This is a classic, classic dominant design. Most pens look something like a Bic pen in some way. So they're, they're recognizable, they're classic, um, and they're omnipresent. Um, they, uh, they defy obsolescence, um, and, and people have emotional attachments to these things. They're, they're nostalgic about them, um, and, you know, changes could risk pro uh, profits. Like, if Bic was to all of a sudden change the design of their pens, people may not use them as much, and, and therefore they would lose market share um, and money. So that would be something that you would risk if you were to change a classic design like the Bic pen. All right, thanks for watching, guys. Bye.